Phineas chuckled from the relative safety of his stinky shelter as the truck raced towards the chain-link fence and broke into laughter as the truck slammed to a halt. Whoever heard of a pickup truck beating high tensile strength steel mesh attached to 30 buried poles, huh, Ferb? Ferb blinked twice and pointed to the bloody messes on the concrete. Oh, right. Sorry. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. So, um, I can't really say what this story is about, at least not in the first, like, 30 seconds or 60 seconds or whatever it is of this video. And depending on how things go, I may have to censor some of what I say further beyond just to avoid demonetization, but I think from the title alone you can tell what it is I'm talking about. This is a fanfiction. It's officially listed as a Kim Possible fanfiction because characters from that are in here too, but I figured Phineas and Ferb was funnier for the title, and it involves all of them being involved in a kerfuffle in Rwanda in 1994, and um, I don't know man, what, what do I say past this point? The story is called Remembering Death by Dr. Cyrus Bortel. It is on hiatus because, you know, after nine chapters I guess he just didn't know what to do past this point. And the description is, Intrepid engineers, blue helmets, and a megalomaniacal weapons scientist scramble for survival as a simmering civil war erupts into genocide, AU in more ways than one, standalone sequel to the first space war. So, I, it's exactly what it sounds like, you know, it's a, essentially a war story about Phineas and Fur stuck in the Rwandan Bazinga! So, weirdly enough, this is something I don't know if I've come across before. It is fan fiction of two, count them, two different franchises that have merged together, but it's also alternate history because the Rwandan Bazinga goes substantially different in this story than it does in the real world, than it did in the real world. Like, I can't go into too much detail about it, partially because it's depressing and partially because, again, demonetization. Uh, but, you know, you can read about it yourself, uh, you can watch the movie Hotel Rwanda, which is a pretty good movie, and it takes place during that whole, uh, ordeal, and I've heard there's some inaccuracies in it, but the general point is gotten across, at least. It was a horrific, horrific event that went down, and in this story, Phineas and Ferb are industrialists who are working in the country, and th they're just foreigners who are setting up a factory and shit there. Uh, and Shigo and Dr. Draken from Kim Possible are also there for whatever reason. Although in this he's called Dr. Dr. Drew Lipsky, which is apparently his real name. But when I first read that, I mistook it for Dr. Drew Pinsky, who is that guy who used to have the reality show about, like, celebrity rehab. And so I, I, <laughs> I thought this was uh, it bringing him into it, and I was... Oh god, the look on my face must have been something. But no, it was, it's just a character from Kim Possible. I, uh, okay, you know what? I'm just gonna start. There's no point in me giving you more. Let's just go. Fur, would you mind passing me the potato slices? Thanks. Oh, cool! The Knowing Channel! Phineas turned up the volume on the TV. The deep water of a certain lake is saturated with carbon dioxide and methane gas. When such a lake is destabilized, vast volumes of carbon dioxide and methane gas are released causing a tsunami and creating a cloud of dense, suffocating carbon dioxide that can travel many kilometers, killing all before it. Such a release event is known as a limnic eruption. Ferb, do you know what this means? Ferb looked on blankly. There are entire lakes out there filled with natural gas. Imagine what we could do with the stuff, and we'd be doing a public service by getting rid of the carbon dioxide, too. Ferb blinked. Okay, we don't own any refineries or chemical plants that we could use, so we'll have to sell the gas or use it to generate electricity on site. The 1986 Limnic eruption in Lake Nyos, Cameroon killed 1,700 people and 3,500 livestock. Lake Kivu, on the border between the Congo and Rwanda, is nearly 2,000 times larger than Lake Nyos, and its shores home to nearly 2 million people. A lake overturn on Lake Kivu would be nothing short of catastrophic. Phineas placed his hand on his chin. What? He doesn't have a chin. His head is a triangle. He doesn't... Okay, you know what? Just, they decide to go to Rwanda and set up a factory there, 
because they can use like the natural gas and carbon dioxide and methane and all that in the lake to power it. And uh, that bit he was talking about there is actually true. Like sometimes lakes will just get a bunch of methane and carbon dioxide that's stuck at the bottom of a lake and the water pressure keeps it there. But if something disturbs it, then it can all rush up all at once and kill a bunch of people. It's like, it's a real thing. We also have a brief interlude where Shigo and Dr. Draken decide to go off and do the same thing. In fact, this is basically what the entire uh, chapter is, the entire first chapter. And then there's a brief author's note where he explains the Rwandan Bazinga and what it was like. And, you know, we're, again, not spend too much time on that, but we're just going past it. And then there is a few more chapters where it's just explaining them setting everything up. It's explaining the situation in Rwanda, Phineas and Ferb going around pointing at stuff going, wow, this is weird and different. Uh, explanations of like the ethnic uh, tensions, let's call them, between Hoodoos and Tutsis, the whole civil war that's going on, you know, all the sorts of things you would need to know as background for this, except Phineas and Ferb are also there. And I just, I, I don't think this is like, something you shouldn't be able to do. I'm just confused as to why. <laughs> the Land Rover drove off the freshly laid asphalt road, through the gate in a chain-link fence, and onto an expansive concrete apron, a, side, a sign proudly proclaiming that the site was a project of the Peach Orchard Infrastructure Consortium, Chinese characters, welcomed the small convoy. A big indigo banner insisted that the people and government of Rwanda warmly welcome the citizens of the joint government. And that is something that's not really explained in this book. Apparently this story is supposed to be a standalone, but it's also a sequel to another one by the same guy. Again, I'm just, I, I cannot be bothered to read more of this shit. I was trying to figure it out. I think in this world, the United States and China and possibly a couple other countries have merged together into a sort of federation, which exists alongside the United Nations. And they just are the most powerful country on earth and that's it uh you don't really need to know a lot else here just that uh, they're apparently the same thing uh there's also a lot more space travel in this world than in the real world which is kind of important to the plot gutsy move by your company coming down the gravity well like that phineas toured a half-built single cell protein plant decorated with the logo of the moon-based butterfly corporation he passed by vats of special bacteria that ate methane and combined it with atmospheric nitrogen and other minerals to produce edible proteins, checking the flow of methane from his platforms as he did so. He passed by synthetic protein modifiers, producing synthetic tofu, meat paste, and egg. Such plants had been essential in the Pacific's drive to exploit and settle the solar system. In protein-starved Rwanda, it would be a, hopefully profitable, godsend. Lipsky lost control of his teleoperated underwater robot, and Shigo painstakingly dragged it back to the surface in a high-pressure suit. Lake Kivu is nearly half a kilometer deep. Do da be da ba da 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 da. I don't know if I'm actually getting the tune right there, but I just I cannot be bothered to check. I don't like Phineas and Ferb much, like the cartoon. I didn't I didn't enjoy it as a child. I don't enjoy it now. So the rest of chapter two is essentially just a montage of Phineas getting this whole factory set up and like talking with some of the people there and explaining a little bit more about the situation. And then at the very end, we get this email which was sent from somebody to somebody else about how the Rwandan president has been assassinated. And in real life, the Rwandan president was a Hutu, a member of the Hutu majority, and his, uh, his death was blamed on the Tutsi rebels, which it probably wasn't them. Uh, but that's what kicked off the Bazinga. And this is where the story really begins, because from this point, Phineas and company, all his friends and everybody, uh, take in a bunch of Rwandan refugees at their industrial center and try to keep them safe. And I, I just... At this point, it basically becomes a military sci-fi story. I shit you not, that is what is happening here. April 7th, 1994. United Nations Assistance Mission for Rwanda, Unimir, Compound. Amahoro Stadium, Kigali, Rwanda. Major Isabella Garcia Shapiro, Joint Government Marines, ran through the tent-filled stadium, bathed in the glow of floodlights. The stadium served as headquarters for UNAMIR, the peacekeeping force tasked with ensuring the smooth implementation of the Arusha peace records between the mostly Tutsi rebels and the mostly Hutu government. So Isabella, who 
I, I didn't know her full name was Isabella Gar Garcia Shapiro. That's a little odd, but okay. Uh, she is apparently some sort of high up commander in the Marines, and she hears about the president's assassination and realizes shit is about to hit the fan, and she's just talking with one of her superiors, and we get shit like this. Isabella shook her head and leaned close. No, we've got new orders, and we have to move fast. The short, dark-haired sergeant raised an eyebrow, and Isabella turned to the door. Let him in. Keep this under wraps, sergeant. Zheng nodded and smiled faintly. See, I feel like that line could have been written better. What if we tried something like this? Now, let's say, hypothetically, you have new orders, and we need to move fast. Does that not mean, hypothetically, that you would have to keep them under wraps, sergeant? Isabella heard the gunfire before she could see the Rwandan militia. Darn it! Checkpoint! <laughs> See, this book does not have any swear words in it. We have people being hacked to death with machetes, people being shot, like it's a whole war story going on, but there's no swearing. That's the important bit. I mean, this is only chapter three. We have a whole bunch of descriptions of like the types of weapons that the militias have and use, and they, uh, the author even acknowledges that they are much more better equipped than they were in real life, let's say, uh, because in real life they had a shortage even of like just basic firearms and ammunition, which is why so many of them were just using machetes to commit the bazinga. I am just constantly in shock <laughs> that this got made. I, I know I don't want to sound like I'm just, I don't know what's, what the term would be here, but I don't want to sound like I'm just being boring and just relaying that this is a thing to you and not adding any of my own jokes or commentary or anything, but I am genuinely at a loss. Like, I don't know <laughs> what to add here. Because like I said, from this point forward, it becomes a military sci-fi story. Because it's characters like Isabella and Phineas and all them who are at a supreme numerical disadvantage. And they have weapons of technology uh, that are beyond what the militias have, but the militias do still have like heavy mortars and vehicles. And there are some French mercenaries <laughs> working with them, which apparently there is some speculation that the French were involved in the real-life Rwandan Bazinga! I don't know if that was true or not, but th there are allegations of it. And so this whole thing starts talking about like why they can't really get help from uh, outside the country because like just like in real life there were some UN peacekeepers there who tried to get help and tried to get permission to you know, use their weapons and like protect some of the civilians who were being Bazinga! outside, but they just, they couldn't get it for many cynical political reasons. And this goes into some of that. And it also talks about all the difficulties with logistics here. Like Rwanda is a country that has really crappy infrastructure. And so in order to get uh, all the equipment and Marines into the country that they would need in order to stop all of this, uh, they have to go by space because it was hinted at earlier that apparently humanity has colonized space at this point and there's other planets and moons and stuff with humans living on them. And so their technology is way, way beyond what ours was in 1994. I don't know if Phineas and Ferb are the ones that invented all of it, but they probably <laughs> helped at least a little. And there's talk about how, again, logistics is very difficult, which made me realize that this author clearly just wanted to write a military sci-fi story, and frankly, he's pretty good at it. Like, some of the battle scenes in here, as brief as they are, are not half bad for an amateur writer, and he clearly seems to understand how a war works, at least on a general level. Like, he understands it's not just, okay, what kind of equipment do they have? How many of them are there? Let's come up with a clever battle strategy, and then that's the end of the day. Like, no, you have to think about logistics and the surrounding political situation, and things like that, which... I mean, okay, a lot of professional military sci-fi writers don't do that, but... And I wouldn't even call this disrespectful, really, to the people that died. Because, again, that's a horrific event, and I don't want to sound like I'm making light of it. I apologize if it comes across that way, but... It's kind of hard not to sound that way when a bunch of Disney cartoon characters are involved here. And it's actually more of like, I don't know, almost a wish fulfillment, because it's specifically mentioned at one point that... Uh, around 10,000 people died in the whole Bazinga! As opposed to the hundreds of thousands who died in real life. And, I mean, I suppose that as far as, like, fantasies go and how he wishes history went, that's pretty good. And, again, he clearly has some talent, and I hope he keeps writing. I hope he sees some success in this genre one day. But 
if you're going to do a fan fiction, why would you go that far outside the realm of the original franchise with it? Like, why would you go that balls to the wall with it? Because, I mean, there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but the whole point of fan fiction is that you can write something without having to do the setup with, like, the characters and the setting. Like, you can just jump right into it, which is why uh, romance, for instance, is so common in the fanfiction community. It's just, hey, we, we already know the setting, we already know the story, we already know these two characters and their relationship, let's just tweak it and have them get together and be all romantic and stuff. Or, hell, in some cases, they don't even have to tweak it. They're just adding a little something more to the story or exploring an aspect of the story a little bit more. And at this stage, this is so far removed from Kim Possible and so far removed from Phineas and Ferb that it may as well just be an original story. So I'm left wondering, Mr. Dr. Professor Cyrus Bortel, uh, why didn't you just write an original story? You know, I, I feel like you could do something with this that could genuinely be good. And hell, I think a lot of people who uh, were around in the Rwandan Bazinga! and remember it would probably also like to fantasize about it going better and a bunch of their loved ones not dying. So, I don't know, this is just... <laughs> it's been a long, long time since I've done an Abominations of Fan Fiction video and I just, I needed to let the world know that this thing is real. This is a real thing that exists in the real world and we all need to know about it. And uh, before I sign off, I just want to say that it is confirmed in one of the later chapters. Because like I said, this is on hiatus. We unfortunately never get a conclusion. Like, we get chapter 8, and then at the beginning of chapter 9, it turns out that the author had been on hiatus for a year, and then he said, I'm going to come back and write more, but then nothing after chapter 9, so whatever. But anyways, in one of the later chapters, we learn that Shigo had apparently trained anti-communist insurgents in both Venezuela and Afghanistan, which means Shigo was one of the Mujahideen, so she very well could have fought alongside Osama bin Laden. Let that lull you to sleep tonight, I guess. Um, there's no greater point to any of this, but check out this story if you're interested in it. Goodbye. Huge thank to everyone watched this far. Thank to $10 and above patron people names Apo Savalainen, Olivia Rayan, Brother Santodis, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Dan Anselievich, Dark King, Dio, Echo, Evie, Flax, Great Grebo, Karkat Kitsune, L. Lindbergh, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Matthew Baudreau, Microphone, Peep the Toad, Return of Cardamom, Roby Reviews, Sad Mardigan, Sillier the Vixen, Tesla Shark, Vevictus, and Wesley, and all the other names. Um, thank to people for give patron money if you want name on list or other patron benefit, consider, donate. If not, share, like, video, comment, subscribe, thank, goodbye. Bazinga.